Hi, Stacey Murphy here with a quick video on exciting garden data. And I'm calling it exciting garden data because I often tell people that one of the six most important things that you can do to make sure that you grow the most amount of food in a small plot garden is record keeping. But record keeping sounds so boring. So I'm calling it exciting garden data. And the reason it's exciting, I'm gonna share three lessons that I've learned from tracking my weekly harvest, from weighing it and measuring it and tracking it. So so that's why data is exciting is you can track it, you can see what you're doing well, and you can replicate that again next year. So that's a bonus. And things that aren't going so well, things that you don't expect uh, and you don't want to see again, you're not finding joy in, you can find it in the data and you can not do that next year. So that's another reason to track the data so you know what not to do. And finally, Mother Nature is filled with patterns. And tracking your data is a way to understand those patterns and to better fit into those patterns and therefore grow more food. So essentially what you're doing is you're increasing your yield, your harvest yield when you are record keeping and you're making decisions from that data year to year. And also what you're doing secondarily or maybe primarily is you're improving your garden joy. You're doing the things you love and you're leaving behind things that are no fun. And basically uh, what the things that are no fun are things that are not bringing you the yield that you want. So that's why garden data is exciting and why I geek out over it. And I'm gonna switch over to some slides to show you the lessons that I've learned. So each week I harvest all of my produce. I lay it all out on a table so that it looks pretty and I take a photo of it so I remember what I harvested each week. And I also weigh every crop individually. So how many pounds of cucumbers, how many pounds of beets, how many pounds of tomatoes. I also uh, count the number of bunches of herbs. Uh, and I'll show you why I do that at the end of this video. So what I'm doing here is I'm basically weighing in my harvest every week and recording the number of pounds of each into what's called a harvest log. And I'll show you some of the lessons that I learned from that harvest log in just a minute. But what I wanted to uh, share with you just before we do that is there are lots of bits of data that you can collect that will help you increase your harvest yield and will also increase your garden joy. So all the different data that you could collect has lessons that you can glean from it. So some of the types of data that you might want to be collecting are any notes to yourself about what you did this year that didn't work out so well that you might want to change next year make sure you write those things down somewhere here's kind of like a typical data it's like a general notebook where you're just taking notes and it's not very organized but it does the trick and sometimes there's diagrams and sometimes there's text so that's one way to collect data Another way to collect data is what's called a crop plan. And this is something that I talk about in a lot of other trainings. Um, it has all of the dates for your seeding, your transplanting, your harvesting, your uh, locations in which you are going to plant those things, and then what your expected yield is. So this is kind of like a, a roadmap for the whole season. And I talk about this in full detail in a lot of other videos. So I'm not gonna talk about it here, but it's a very helpful tool to start using. Um, another bit of data that you can collect is the incidences of pests and diseases. And you can go through and you can say, all right, this week in May, let's say it's May 9th, I'm starting to notice that there are some aphids. I'm just recognizing a couple. They're not a problem. They're not affecting my yield. They're not, they're not uh, becoming a problem yet, but I'm noticing them. So I'm going to say, okay, they're at a one level. Um, and then, you know, sometime later, maybe like June 6th, basically what's happening is the aphids ha are totally eating my crop and the crop is beyond all repair and I probably have to pull it out. That's a pretty high number. Here I'm giving it an eight. I have to do something about it. So at a one, you might notice them. You might not do anything yet. You might want to do some preventative measures. So what, what this does for you, this bit of data, is it tells you over the course of a season when each pest comes to full maturity in your garden space and you can prepare for it. So that's a really good piece of data to have. Um, it'll help you next year for sure. This, you know, this year it might not help you quite as much. And then uh, another bit of data that's really helpful to know, rainfall and weather. So more and more climate change uh, is occurring on a global scale and droughts are happening, massive uh, storms are happening and hurricanes. So here is a really simple way to put in how many inches of precipitation every day of the year 
and then any uh, remarks uh, or severe weather notes that you want to put in as well. So this is very useful to see from year to year and because you can link it up and check it against your harvest log. And then another type of data, data is visual reminders, just putting down in a garden journal photos of what's going on so that you can remember what things looked like. Another bit of data that you can collect is compost turning and temperature. So if you have a compost pile, uh, the number of days until it becomes compost can be significantly shortened if you turn the pile and keep that temperature hot. So you can actually take data and understand what's going on in your compost pile. You can do some soil fertility logs and understand how much compost, how much manure, how much, uh, how much cover crops you have done to each one of your planting beds so you understand uh, what the level of fertility is in that bed. You can do seeding and propagation logs which show you whether or not certain seeds uh, have germinated well or not and at what temperatures that they've done well. So that's useful data to have. So those are all, that's all data that you can collect. Um, but the first thing that I would recommend that you collect, if you were going to collect one bit of data, this is the one that I would collect. Collect a harvest log. So all it takes is putting the crops down the left-hand side of the screen, the weeks across the top, uh, and I do this in an Excel spreadsheet or in Google uh, Documents, basically. And the reason I do it here is that it, I can put in calculations and uh, I can put in... Uh, equations that will calculate everything for me. So basically what this is, my crops on the left hand side and then week by week how much, how many pounds of each that I'm harvesting. So I can look and say okay in on uh, let's say uh, July 15th I harvested, if you look down at the bottom of the screen, I harvested 27.25 pounds of produce. And then if you look over a couple of weeks over and you look down at July 29th, I harvested 53 pounds of produce that week. So you get a total per week. And then if you look across, you get a total per crop. And you can see if you know how many uh, tomatoes you have, let's say, how many plants you have, and then you can take the total number of pounds of tomatoes divided by the number of plants, and you get the pounds per plant that you're getting for your different tomatoes. So there's a lot of great useful information here. And then you can also find at the bottom right-hand corner is the total number of pounds of harvest that has come out of this garden. And this is about half of the season and, and already has been harvested 360 eight pounds of produce. So this is a really useful document to have uh, and so each week uh, it's super easy, weigh everything and just plug in the numbers. It doesn't take more than a couple minutes. So what are some of the lessons that you learn from using this document? Well the first lesson that I learned was about my shade and everybody wants to try to maximize their space in their garden and so basically what I learned by doing this technique was that my lettuce, uh, or let's say I also grew arugula, so lettuce or arugula, uh, in that shaded area, it gets kind of dappled light from the tree above, but it gets a lot of shade. It grew in pretty well. It was a little bit small. It was about half of the yield, and it took about one week extra than typical lettuce takes. So if typical lettuce takes 28 days to grow into baby lettuce and to be cut down, this took... 28 plus 7 is 33 days. Um, and then cabbage, on the other hand, took a lot longer. So cabbage is a longer maturing crop. And the cabbage that was in the sun, you can see there's like a little part of sun just below where that arrow is. It's pointing to the cabbage. Those cabbage heads got pulled out of the ground because they basically came to maturity exactly when they were supposed to. They came to maturity at about 60, 60 days. And then the cabbage that was there stayed in the ground another eight weeks. Can you believe that? So eight weeks is the same as about 60 days. And so basically I got, for these cabbage heads, they came in uh, two months late and half the yield. So whereas my other cabbage heads were like a pound a head, these were like a half a pound a head. So uh, what I discovered is that it makes more sense to grow arugula or salad mixes in the shade than it does cabbage because I only lose a week and maybe half the yield, whereas with cabbage, I lose a couple months and that's a really long time. So uh, that's a big lesson that I learned from 
keeping track of that harvest log and writing down exactly the dates of when everything comes in because I have the planting log that says when everything went in the ground. And the next thing that I learned was about varieties and the question was which variety yields more. So a lot of people, you know, they love their leafy greens and they have a very particular favorite. And um, for me, I I love lacinato kale. I like the texture of it. I like that the aphids don't really find it as easily. They don't really get caught up in the leaves as easily. Um, I think it tastes really great. Um, and I love the color of it. So I'm a really big fan of lacinato kale. I really love collard greens too. And uh, I cook collard greens differently than I cook kale, but I love both of those greens. So that's what you see here on the green. The collards are on the right, the kale's on the left. Now, what I learned from my harvest log is that generally with the same number of plants, let's say there is 10 plants in the ground, I'm getting uh, two pounds of collards and I'm only getting one pound of lacinato kale each week with the same spacing. They're about 12 inches apart. So uh, what that means is that the collards in, in my particular space, in my particular garden, the way that I plant, I get twice as much yield out of the collards. And so it's like just a slightly different variety. In this case, uh, a you know, a different plant, but similar type of plant, and I get a lot more produce. Now, if I were growing for me, I would grow collards and I would grow lacinato kale. And then I have a CSA and they love red Russian kale, which also produces about two pounds a week. So if I was running a CSA only, I might choose to only grow the red Russian kale and drop out the collards, drop out the kale complete, the lacinato kale, and just grow red Russian. So depending on which variety you want, uh, you can look at which one yields more. And by the way, Kalaloo, if, if you want a green that produces a lot, uh, Kalaloo is a Jamaican spinach, and it is ridiculous how much yield comes out of the same space with Kalaloo. I would say it's um, probably twice as much as collards. Uh, is what you'll get from the Kalaloo. All right, and the third thing that I learned that was really important was really noticing the difference between what was me and what was the weather. So in 2009, uh, I got started late. I put my tomatoes in the ground mid-June, which is almost in the middle of growing season in Brooklyn, New York, and I got about six pounds per plant on those particular uh tomatoes and I planted early girls because I like them because they come in early. I like to grow a variety of tomatoes. I like early girls because they're early. I like sun golds because they come in early and they're plentiful. I like green zebra heirloom tomatoes because they're small so you get a lot of them. So if you have a CSA they get a lot of smaller tomatoes which is useful and I love brandy wines just because they're big and they're luscious um, and they're just so delicious. So I typically grow those four varieties and I get a different amount of pound per plant depending on which tomato. So in 2009 I got six pounds per plant. I put them in the ground really late. 2010 comes along I, and that particular year I, I put my tomatoes in the ground and somebody else tended my tomatoes and they didn't uh, necessarily prune as much as I did. Um, and what happened in 2010 was a drought and the tomatoes actually loved the drought. It was hot and dry. Um, and so we got eight pounds per plant, um, and I think we probably could have gotten more had we pruned a little bit more. T 2011, five pounds per plant because there was a hurricane. So uh, somewhere near the end of the season, all the blooms got blown off the plant. We ended up with about five pounds per plant. Same thing in 2012. We had another hurricane, two hurricanes in a row in Brooklyn. And uh, that year we got about six pounds per plant. The hurricane came in a little bit later in the season. Um, 2013, 2014, I didn't grow in that particular space. 2015, I only got one pound per plant because I, I should have known better. I bought a six pack of, of uh, early girl tomatoes. They didn't look great. And I thought to myself, I, should, I shouldn't put these in the ground. They don't look great. But I had one opportunity to put them in the ground and the next opportunity was a month later with different plants. And I thought, well, I'll, it's better to get them in the ground early. So I put them in. They never did anything. They never produced. Uh, it was a terrible, terrible year for those tomatoes. So if I have this data, then I can start to understand that five and six pounds of, of tomatoes per plant for my early girls 
that's in my bad years. That's that's those are years when I have hurricanes or when I get them in the ground really really late, and I know that I can get more from them than that. So here's and if I didn't have this data of every different year and I just had data from one year, it would be hard for me to tell whether or not it was something that I did or if it was some sort of weather condition that uh, brought about the amount of yield per plant. So each and every year, it doesn't matter if you're a complete beginner, you want to start tracking data as soon as possible, your harvest log in particular. So start taking that harvest data. And the biggest lesson that comes out of harvest data is understanding is it worth it for you to grow your own? So when you start to measure your harvest every week and weigh it, uh, what you're doing is you're basically assigning a worth to it because you know that when you go to the store or the farmer's market that the, that pound, that number of pounds of produce is worth a certain price and you can start to calculate how much your produce is worth. So you can go through and you can say, well, my 80 pounds of tomatoes because I had eight pounds per plant and I had 10 plants, so I have 80 pounds at about $3 a pound, that's lowballing it because some of my tomatoes are heirlooms worth more like four or five dollars a pound. So that's like $240 worth of tomatoes. Six pounds of arugula at $10 a pound is $60. Right there it's $300 and the list goes on and on. So I can start to calculate uh, how much I have earned by growing my own produce and deciding whether or not it's worth it for me to grow each crop. And if it's not worth it for you to grow that crop because it, you spent too much time and energy and resources to grow it and you didn't get enough value out of it, then maybe you don't want to grow it next year. Or you understand that you're growing it because it tastes better and because it's the pride of growing it yourself and maybe a particular crop you know you might not get the value worth. So that's a couple tips. This is what you can learn when you start to measure your harvest. And keep in mind, when you're, when you're trying to understand how many pounds of produce uh, that you're growing, you're only going to know if you weigh it the time when you harvest it. Uh, after the harvest, if you want to start to estimate how much you grew this year, take a look at this photo for a minute and I'll give you a couple hints. So these cucumbers are about medium-sized cucumbers and it's about a half a pound to a quarter to three quarters of a pound per cucumber. Those tomatoes, the, the red tomatoes that are on the screen are the early girls. They're about a half a pound each. The green zebras are a little bit less than that, about a third of a pound. And then when you think about your beets and your radishes and your root vegetables, those are kind of easy. Um, you know from going to the store, a lot of times they're by pound, and you look and typically there's like three medium beets in a, in a bunch. That's because three medium beets is a pound. About six medium carrots in a bunch is a pound. Eight to 10 radishes in a group is a pound. And if you look at your bunching greens, uh, somewhere between 12 and 15 uh, stalks of collards or kale will be about a half a pound. So it just depends on the size of those leaves. So that's a couple tips and you can learn a whole lot from weighing your harvest every week. I highly recommend that you keep that harvest log. You're gonna see trends in the data and you're gonna be able to make decisions about what is worth growing. That's it for this video. I'll see you in the next one.